Good morning. Uh, today I have the very easy job of uh, presenting the ground round speaker who is uh, very well known to all of you, I'm sure. Dr. Harvey uh, wears many hats uh, at Winship. He is the director of the phase one clinical trial program. He is the chair of the data safety monitoring committee. Uh, and he mentors a lot of the faculty here through the phase one program on developing their own clinical trials and conducting their own clinical trials. Really, the um, phase one program has been uh, a focal point, I think, for us in terms of uh, our research activity as an institution and also a focal point for us in terms of collaboration between the different disease uh, types and a focal point for mentorship and development of junior faculty. Uh, and that's uh, in no small part due to uh, Donald's uh, efforts and his uh, vision to make this a very collaborative group. Today he will be talking to us a lot about uh, a very hot topic that uh, many of us are not always thinking about, which is biosimilars. But biosimilars are really a fact of life and uh, they are going to be coming at us very quickly, very soon. They are already coming at us very quickly, very soon. So uh, I'm looking forward to hearing about this and learning more about this uh, uh, very important topic that we don't always uh, think about in our day-to-day -day practice. So thank you, Donald. All right, thank you, Dr. Arreyes. And um, uh, first and foremost, uh, I'm a pharmacist, and so pharmacists like to talk about drugs a lot, but more importantly, pharmacists like to think about new drugs as we uh, consider them in their development. And today is going to be a little bit of a different talk from previous talks I've given because this is really, I think, more of an educational approach. I've been doing some work with ASCO and other groups on biosimilars and where they, where they live and what the um, positives and potential drawbacks might be to them. Uh, but overall, it's, it's here to stay, as Dr. Aureus mentioned. And if you follow the money, it's pretty easy to figure out why biosimilars are being developed, and certainly the ones that are closest to approval are being developed. When you look at biologic spending by diseases, you can see our world is about a third of all of biologics. And so that's the cancer world. And then there are the other worlds of um, areas like rheumatoid arthritis, which is a large proportion. Certainly, we know about IVIG. Uh, I have a close personal friend who works in hemophilia. Um, and if you look at our, our overall sales within the US of all, of all dollars and all drugs, biologics uh, contain a huge proportion of these. And so I've bolded the ones that are biologics and I've italicized and bolded the ones that are uh, within the cancer space. And so rituximab, bevacizumab, and trastuzumab are all within the top eight in sales per billion in uh, the US. So this is billion dollar sales in the US alone. And so the only one that really does is small molecules. We still see cancer in Revlimid, uh, but also um, hepatitis C in Harvoni. So this will likely not be this much forever. Um, this will likely continue to some degree, uh, but these are, are intriguing drugs and will likely continue a biologics point of view overall. And when you combine Neupogen with Nulasta, that is about 4.7 billion. And so the biologic sales within the US are huge and thus are a target for a variety of thoughts. In cancer, about 29% of biologics are the global pharmaceutical sales, 68 billion worldwide by 2020. So um, that also is a huge number globally, and they're emerging with the areas of, of markets called farm emerging markets. And so sort of second world nations, as you might think of them, are starting to increase in their use of these drugs as well and represent a large market for pharma. Uh, since 2012, there are 50 new biologics or indications, and this year alone, it's been about 50-50 for indications for small molecules and um, biologics with, of course, CAR T-cell therapy being approved as well. So thinking about the global categories of biologics and what might fall under this umbrella of biosimilars and where they might, might be, monoclonal antibodies top the list because they are by far the most common and certainly the most, uh, the most profitable. There are also complex sugars. Don't forget that heparin is a complex sugar. It's a glycosaminoglycan. It's a lot of things that are naturally derived that can be manufactured. Blood derivatives, and so we're common in hemoglobin would fall under this. Would it ever actually get to market, uh, which it hasn't or failed attempts back in the, uh, in the 90s. Vaccines, and then finally the areas where we really think about cytokines and glycoproteins, so interleukin, interferon, 
um, GCSF, epoetin, darbopoietin, and pegylated forms of all of these. Also, don't forget enzymes are biological products, and so asparaginase, pegasparaginase, glucarpidase within our areas are also potential biosimilar categories, thrombolytic agents, and finally, any factor product. So regulatory-wise, and this talk's going to be a fair bit about regulatory stuff, so I'm going to try to dress this up. Sometimes talking about regulatory items is a little bit like putting lipstick on a pig, but regulatory drives a lot of what is being done in this space, and there was really no path to a, an equivalent generic for a biological product. And so what companies did when you look at all the way back to Epoetin, they, they really patented the process of what was being done, not the final product. And so Amgen, when Epoetin was, was FDA approved, they have really went the patent on the intellectual property was the cellular manufacturing process. And so that reflects the, al the alteration in the regulatory landscape of how the data has to be presented for biosimilars, and I'll go into that. Um, and so if you think about it, a new biosimilar, a new therapeutic protein that's got to be, that is going to reference a, an existing protein really isn't a generic because it's, it's a process plus a final product. And so thinking about these as generics is a little bit too simplistic. And so these biosimilar pathways for regulatory approval came about thanks to the uh, Biologics Price Competition and Innovation Act which was part of the Public Health Service Act signed in 2009, and it created an abbreviated pathway for companies to pursue biosimilar products. The definition of a biosimilar is meant to be that they're supposed to mimic the existing approved agent that's out there. And so we'll go through a number of categories and a number of drugs that are there. They're not identical, and that's an important point. The generics are identical to the reference product. Biosimilars are not exactly identical. Um, the approval process as part of that PHS was part of the Affordable Care Act, and so that was all ushering in a new wave of competition within the biosimilar and biological product space. They should show no clinically meaningful differences in safety and efficacy. And I'll talk about how that's going to be shown within trials, and then the clinically inactive um, components uh, may be permitted in minor ways. And overall, the idea is to try to encourage competition. When you look to see who's getting into this space from a pharmaceutical company perspective, you'll see it's not a small space and it's certainly still a competitive space. So if you think about it, small molecules versus biologics, aspirin's tiny. These are small drugs. They're easily replicated in the lab. You know the structure of aspirin. You can create acetyl salicylic acid pretty easily. When you start to increase in size of proteins, it becomes more challenging. So insulin, erythropoietins, a little around 30,000 uh, 30, Daltons, and then finally, any monoclonal antibody, whether it's an IgG1 backbone or an IgG4 backbone, which are the most uh, monoclonal antibody subtypes that are produced, these are very large molecules, 150,000 uh, Daltons in molecular size, and so the, just the simple creation of them is, is a very different approach than, say, a small molecule. So when you compare them to their reference agents as well, you've got generics and you've got a series of, you have a chemical structure that's been patented. And so when you look at Taxol, when you look at Docetaxel, they're large structures, for, but they're still small molecules. And the structure itself of Docetaxel is patent, was patented by uh, Sanofi back in the day, Sanofi Aventis. But it's pretty easy to look at it, see what you need to do, and a good chemist will be able to create synthetic steps to get to that final product, and that can be easily regulated by FDA. They can say, all right, well, you started with this material and you eventually got your way to this material, and we can assay that material. We can see how much of it is docetaxel. We can see if you started here along the way, what are the impurities that might be left in the final formulation? That's a very different approach with a protein um, from a manufacturing uh, process perspective. And so we'll talk about that and how that might change throughout the, um, the time, but they are living systems. And so these are cellular systems that are creating these large proteins. Chinese hamster ovary cells were sort of the classic beginning for epoetin, and you transfect those cells and create a, a system that then pumps out these proteins, hopefully in the way that you're expecting them to. The approval process now for, um, for biosimilars are these bi biosimilar biologics licensing applications. Uh, and this, again, is their outcome. Uh, with a generic, don't forget, you can just give generic, um, you know, generic dose of Taxol and say, well, if I give 75 per meter squared of brand name um, Taxotere and 75 per meter squared of generic dose of Taxol, 
All I have to show is that they're within 30% of each other in their pharmacokinetics, and that's it. That's really all you have to do for a generic drug. You have to show a number of things on the form formulation side, but from a clinical perspective, all you have to do is show bioequivalence, which is really a pharmacokinetic endpoint. There's no clinical data there. There's no efficacy data there. It's just, we are just like this other small molecule. You can't do that with biosimilars. So the biosimilar and reference product need to have, again, no clinically meaningful differences in terms of safety, purity, and potency. And just by that definition, a large part of this is the manufacturing process. And so what a company with a biosimilar has to show is really that the process they are undertaking to produce the end product is very rigorous and very reproducible all along the way. And so FDA's oversight, the regulatory oversight here and in the EU is very much focused on those manufacturing processes. And it's a very sequential approach. And I was just talking with, doc, with Dr. El Reyes beforehand, people are already putting in ways and patents to try to create drugs that are FDA approved now. So nivolumab, pembrolizumab, there are biosimilar patents being put in now because it takes a while. It's a very sequential process and there are many pitfalls along the way as these proteins are created. And so the first step is really an analytical study of structure and function. You have the antibody, you have the reference product, and you look at that and you say, okay, we've got to really go pretty deep into protein chemistry, into folding, into the way the structure looks. The antibody, IgG1, IgG4, how does it fix complement? How does it bind? What parts of the antibody do we really need to make sure we can reproduce? And it's not like creating a sandcastle, it's like creating the Empire State Building. And so there are layers upon layers of things that have to be done. The animal studies have to be done to show tox, and again, with monoclonal antibodies, those are somewhat abbreviated because that's the nature of preclinical uh, pre development within antibodies. Then the clinical studies of PK and PD and immunogenicity. Immunogenicity takes on a huge role with biosimilars. It's an important role within therapeutic proteins that are reference drugs like the, the Keytrudas, like the Opdivos of the world, but the biosimilar nivolumab will have a much greater emphasis on immunogenicity, and I'll show you why in a second. And then finally, there are comparative clinical studies to determine equivalence. That's clinical studies to determine equivalence, not bioequivalence, which is also done. So there are actual clinical trials of biosimilars that have to be performed, but I'll show you that they don't have to be the same as the reference product. All along the way, companies then submit their data to FDA for review. And FDA looks at them very carefully at every step of this process. So when you look at the reference biologic and the, and the biosimilar that's trying to, um, to come to market, then you've really got only two major areas where FDA and companies are forced to make sure they are exactly the same. That's the amino acid sequence of the protein, and that's how they work. This is pretty, pretty straightforward. It's binding assays, it's a few other things. But then you can have many dis differences within the two groups. The manufacturing processes, what host cell line you use to get to the protein, the structure itself, and that's folding, that's not amino acid. It's more about how the protein comes together overall. Uh, the inactive ingredients, and then with a reference biologic, they have to prove as a first in market compound their efficacy and safety uh, in a large number of patients across multiple indications. The biosimilar just has to prove similarity to that reference biologic clinically. And I'll give you examples of both of those. So the, from a pharmacy perspective, the, spe the formulation may be different with the biosimilar. The delivery device or the container may be different. It may be an injection, it may be a vial, it may be lyophilized, maybe liquid. It doesn't have to be exactly the same as the reference product. The route depends on the label, and so don't forget that the FDA approves a label, and that label dictates route. So when a drug like Velcade comes out, they have a new label for subcutaneous administration. That's a new series of, of clinical trials that have to be done to get that new label. Um, the conditions of use uh, now include all indications for the reference product, and I'll show you that in, in the examples of Bevacizumab and Trastuzumab. Vial concentration must be the same though, and so you have to have the exact same concentration of the drug in the vial as the reference product. And then the potential molecular differences are things we'll talk about. And those are things, again, you may substitute amino acids at various places, but they've got to end in, this, in a similar overall amino acid structure. The N and C terminal modifications may be there. 
um, disulfide bonds. And then finally, there, every protein when it's made undergoes post-translational modifications. That means that when the protein is translated by the cell line and starts to be created in larger and larger amounts, it actually undergoes some changes after it's made. And those changes can change uh, the relative structure of the, or the relative activity of the drug and may change some of the um, immunogenicity. And that's the biggest issue within these compounds is do, do the post-translational modifications impact the immunogenicity of the protein overall? And the biggest one that, that FDA and companies look at is the degree of glycosylation. So when you add glyco, uh, when you glycosylate proteins more and more and you add more, uh, more residues to the protein, that can change the way that it interacts with host biological cells. And then finally, other things that may happen, and that's pegylation. Don't forget biologics aren't just the protein. You can pegylate them to change the way that they circulate and be able to change their route. You can add a payload to them. So there are possibilities of biosimilars for drugs like brintuximab vidotin for TDM1. Those fall under the biologics category. It's going to be a lot more work to do it, but those would also be possible biosimilars. So again, the multiple major steps that are involved are selecting the gene of interest to produce the protein, inserting that gene into a host, replicating the line and the protein expression, harvesting it from the cell, which can also be a challenge, and then finally purifying the protein of interest. So you get sort of a large gamish of proteins within a reactor, a bioreactor, and you're trying to really separate out what's there. Uh, the final product has to be highly similar to the reference product, notwithstanding minor differences in inactive components. And so looking at this and looking through the whole process, again, the target splicing of the DNA, or the target DNA portion is spliced, it's inserted into a vector to create uh, the protein of interest, and then that cell system expresses it in some fashion. You then mu uh, multiply the cell systems, uh, ramp them up for, um, for a bioreactivity. That growth is, and the media is expanded into these bioreactors. Um, this is old hat for a company like Amgen. Thus, Amgen is getting into the biosimilar game very aggressively. Uh, then you recover these through filtration and centrifugation to get the protein of interest. You purify it through uh, chromatography, and then you have bulk drug that you can package however you want to. And what is FDA and, and what do companies want to look at from references specifically? The structure, the properties, the binding, and the stability. And so when you look very specifically at the physicochemical properties, it's both the FAB regions and the FC regions. And don't forget that all antibodies may have different FC um, activities. When you look at drugs like, and we accept those, when you look at drugs like cetuximab and panitumumab, they are different antibodies, but they do both target EGFR. So we accept that they're different. They're both on the market, and then it's up to a variety of, um, of ways to see uh, how they get used. But they may have differing primary structures with these disulfide bonds and the product variants. They may form aggregates. They may be clipped. And these are all the, um, the post-translational modifications that may happen. And then from a biological per perspective, how do they bind the target of interest on the FAB region? How are they neutralized? Are they immunoreactive with host cells? And then the FC binding portion, how much does it activate complement? Um, how much does the back end then work in terms of activating natural killer cells, other cells that might be important for uh, an immunoreactivity? So all of this is, is scrutinized heavily both within the, uh, uh, the company as well as at FDA when sent. And so when you think about why does this matter, well, it matters because there are actually two examples of manufacturing differences that led to major clinical problems. One was Eprex in 1998. Many of you will remember this case. It was a drug that was FDA approved in Europe. It was on the market in 98. It was a somewhat equivalent drug to Epoetin, but was only in the, in the European market. And all of a sudden, there was, in 1998, a sharp spike in the red, pure red cell aplasia cases that were seen with patients on dialysis who were getting it. And they found that there was a, an incredibly small change in the manufacturing um, process, although it's not really that small when you really talk about it, but it's changing the stabilizer in the vial from albumin to polysorbate 80, which is a relatively minor change in the manufacturing and distribution of a drug um, to change a stabilizer and they went through all the processes to do it, but the addition of polysorbate 80 changed the immunoreactivity of the protein. And that then led to antiarthropoietin antibodies that led to pure red cell aplasia. Similarly, and there's been an example in the biosimilar space with a pegylated equivalent of epoetin, and that's um, peganacetide. 
Uh, they also, it got a biosimilar approval in 2012, and um, there were also shown to be neutralizing antibodies to erythropoietin, to circulating endogenous erythropoietin, and the U.S. new drug application was withdrawn in 2014. So this was experience in Europe that led to no approval in the U.S. So where are we now in the biosimilar landscape of um, drugs that are either here or on their way? I think one thing to remember is that we have biosimilars on the market today in the United States. It's just not in cancer. We're not, that, we're not as familiar with these drugs um, that are out there today. And within cancer, we do have it, and that's Phil Graston, uh, SNDZ. Uh, and that's the recombinant GCSF, and so these are the data that led to it. It was approved in 2015. And so supportive care is one thing, active treatment of cancer is another. And we'll talk about the differences with biosimilars there. But there, are, um, there is an, a biosimilar within oncology uh, that we have approved today. The others are in immunology and rheumatology, and so infliximab, uh, etanercept, and adalimumab are all within the rheumatoid arthritis space and, and uh, immunology space. They're approved in various ways. You can see that much like a generic, uh, there are patent litigations against the reference protein that are ongoing and will likely continue to be ongoing for the next two to three years uh, to try to maintain of the, of the reference protein the exact uh, more, more protection of that patent over time. So uh, biosimilar antineoplastics are here. And these are active agents that are being used and potentially used in the treatment of active cancer. In July of this year, um, at the, uh, there were two ODACs that came together, one in the morning, one in the afternoon, um, for MYL14010, and that's from Biocon and Myelin. And it's a proposed biosimilar to Herceptin, so trastuzumab. That was the morning session. Uh, the afternoon session was a biosimilar to bevacizumab put forward by Amgen. Uh, and both of them were unanimously approved by the Oncology Drug Advisory Committee in support of all current licensed indications for the reference product. So these are here. This is ODAC's approval, and now it's at FDA to decide what they're going to do. So 16-0 is pretty clear, at least in terms of the Oncology Drug Advisory Committee, uh, and what they believe um, these drugs should be, what the decision should be by FDA, uh, and we'll go through and dive into some of the data that led to these, um, these thoughts. So again, these biosimilars uh, are really heavily invested in the biological, um, in the chemistry manufacturing and control application. And so if you go to the FDA website and you look at these documents for the ODAC, about 50% of each document is CMC. And so that's, there are lots of chromatographs there are lots of studies of how these drugs each way got folded, uh, reference versus parent in the manufacturing, how they look at each step along the way. Uh, and so that's literally 50% of the document showing equivalence at the manufacturing level. Um, then clinical pharmacology, immunogenicity, and clinical outcomes are also assessed. And so within the clinical outcomes, um, the first part of it is FDA works with a company and says, look, these are your benchmarks for your biosimilar product. You're going to, you can elect to go in however you want to. You have to do one major study for biosimilarity and similarity to the reference study. But here's what we expect your, your benchmarks and endpoints to be based on meta-analysis of the data in your space. So for um, the Avastin uh, biosimilar from Amgen, they elected to pursue a combination with carboplatin and paclitaxel in non-small cell lung cancer. And they did that in the EU. They did it with the EU version of bevacizumab, which the FDA said, that's fine. We're OK with that. And they compared it to brand name of Aston. That was their similarity trial. Um, and for, uh, for the Herceptin biosimilar, they compared it uh, to, um, to the brand name Herceptin. And this was their design. So they loaded in the exact same fashion, maintained in the exact same fashion, uh, but then added on a taxane in a similar design as the Hercules trial, and then went on to maintenance <coughs> doses until progression. So they really tried to just mimic what was already out there in terms of the data with Herceptin in their primary, um, in one of their primary indications. So the other thing that comes into it is PK and PD. And so for PK, the dosing of these drugs is such that you have normal male volunteers in both groups, 
getting a single dose of three milligrams per kilogram of bevacizumab as the biosimilar or the brand name of Aspen. And then PK is measured and the curves directly overlap. I won't bore you. But the area under the curve was exactly the same with both drugs. And here's how we know they're exactly the same. There's the reference for Avastin, for example, and the, the overlapping AUC was between 0.98 and 1.03. This is the way the FDA reports these data. And it was, um, it was a 20 patient in each, or 20 subject in each group comparison. They also compare target binding assays to the, to the uh, ligand of interest. And so for Herceptin, it's obviously the HER2 receptor on the cell. Again, um, that binding assay with the reference for Herceptin was well within one. The binding assay for VEGFA for the uh, biosimilar was a little broader, but still covered one based on the expectations of the designs from FDA. And so again, showing biosimilarity per FDA definitions for both of these. Cell prolifer proliferation assays for the target cell of interest, so HER2 expressing cells, breast cancer cells, uh, and VEGF expressing cells uh, that are dependent upon it for growth. Again, similar assays. Now, when you look at the um, when you look at the overall response rate within the clinical trials, so all this is together, and it's the last third of the application. Uh, the overall response rate for the brand Herceptin with that Hercules type um, trial was 64 percent. The overall response rate for uh, the myelin biosimilar was 70 percent. And again, the ratio of that overall response rate crossed one. And thus, FDA said, based on the predefined characteristics, you are biosimilar based on this overall response rate. Same thing happened with bevacizumab in um, the non-small cell lung cancer population. And the ratio, again, for the um, comparator to the reference uh, crossed one per the definitions of biosimilarity put forward by FDA for the standard. These are the vial sizes as well. So where are we going with these drugs overall, and how will we get there? Well, the biosimilars with phase three data are already out. There are a number that are happening. These are the patent expirations for each brand name product, each brand name reference product. Cetuximab and rituximab, this is gonna be huge. Don't forget rituximab was higher than bevacizumab and trastuzumab in annual sales, and so it'll depend on how biosimilars go after uh, indications. But these are the compounds that are out there that have phase three data now. So the RTX M83 had equivalent PK and safety in DLBCL. They're waiting for the readout uh, for the clinical trial for that, um, for that agent. And there are others that are listed here. You can see there are many, many compound, many, many companies that are going after rituximab as biosimilars. Uh, bevacizumab and trastuzumab also have additional compounds uh, that are undergoing phase three evaluation or have phase three data. So if we get these biosimilars on the market, who's gonna use them? So that's, that's probably one of the biggest concerns from a clinical perspective. And what's gonna be the level of confidence for people to actually use them? So FDA has said, we believe they're biosimilar. Um, companies have said that have come forward with these compounds say, we think we've shown they're biosimilar. That's all well and good, but once these drugs are actually approved, what's gonna dictate how they get used in the clinic? And the first is the idea around these standards that we have today. And so we have, when we think about drug use in the clinic for any given molecule or any given drug, whether it's paclitaxel versus nabpaclitaxel or uh, cetuximab versus panitumumab, we have these practice standards that we use. What are the documented practice standards? Well, it's basically uh, me saying, well, we use this all the time and we feel good about it. That's sort of the best documentation of a lot of practice standards that are out there. Uh, the other is restricted formularies and clinical pathways. So these may be, those may be dictated by insurance providers. Those may be dictated at the institutional level. Uh, they may be dictated by the, the overarching health insurance plan. And then you have evidence-rated compendia like NCCN. Then you have the reference biologic labeled indication for biosimilars. And so what did Avastin get on its label? What did uh, Herbitux get on its label? And then you have the biosimilar labeled indication, which as of today, these two circles will overlap because that's been a relatively recent change by FDA to say, look, if you get a biosimilar trial, we'll give you labeling for all the indications that are there because you can't replicate every single trial. Then it becomes non-valuable non, non or less valuable in terms of costs. And people believe that biosimilars are going to be priced less. And there's gonna be a lot of, um, it'll, be a lot, it'll be interesting to see how that plays out from a marketing perspective. 
So there are another, there are some, uh, some more um, regulatory definitions that have to be talked about. One is interchangeability, one is switching, and one is substitution. These all sound like the same thing. I get it. These, are, these sound like they're exactly the same thing that's happening, but the reality is they're not. Interchangeability is a federal definition. The FDA will define what is interchangeable with, between each agent in a class. Um, and they define that for drugs like ACE inhibitors. They'll say that captopril is interchangeable with lisinopril. Um, or you can elect to do that or not. And companies, biosimilar companies, can elect to go after an interchangeable definition as they put in their application for approval. Um, and so the idea is interchangeability is that this, the same patient getting the same drug will respond in the same way from a safety and efficacy perspective. It's not required, and biosimilars to date have not done this so far, but it is a path for them. But switching and substitution happens at the local pharmacy level. So if you write MS cotton able to be substituted, then it can be substituted with a generic. If you write, you know, lisinopril brand generic, it can be substituted at the level of the pharmacy at Walgreens, and that's determined at the state level. So interchangeability. So the first biotechnology process that I believe happened was the fermentation of beer. Yeast fermentation in 4000 BC. So there was beer made in the Middle East, mostly because the water was too bad to drink. And so beer, if you fermented it, you actually ended up getting good, reasonably safe water to drink. But when you think about yeast fermentation, lots of different things happen in that fermentation process. And so if you take a very specific example, a German Pilsner, a major source of reference is for me is beeradvocate.com. And so Beer Advocate lists 3,029 different types of Pilsners that are currently available in the world today. And if you do that and you start to look at all the German Pilsners that are listed in there, you have a number of, of some um, well-known national and international uh, beers. You have some local beers. And you have some others that sort of fit in between the classic German category. So the question for you as a consumer becomes, are all these the same? From a, an overarching definition, they are all the same. They are all German Pilsners. They're different within the class, and I would suggest that some of you in this room would much prefer something like this or this over this, but that's a preference. That's not a global arching interchangeable definition. And so if you are thinking about this process and sort of being jaded in, in terms of biosimilars, there is precedent out there and are these equivalent or interchangeable? And you might say, well, that's kind of up to the consumer to some degree, but we believe as the FDA's perspective, these are interchangeable. So what does interchangeable mean and what will companies have to do to show interchangeability at the highest level? So is the ability to switch from a biosimilar to a reference product without a concern? Meaning you might start a patient on a Vastin, they lose insurance or something happens, and we want to reduce their drug bill, and we're going to change them to the Amgen biosimilar. Can you feel confident as a clinician doing that? Well, FDA says you can, but only if the biosimilar company does this type of trial, which hasn't been done yet. But this is their guidance for the biosimilar product. They say, look, you're going to have to have a three-arm study with the reference that's licensed in the US. Right now, as was shown in the Amgen Bevacizumab biosimilar, you can use the EU approved product. You don't have to use the US approved product. But in the US, if you're gonna to try to go for interchangeability, you have to have this type of a design with the US licensed reference product, with your biosimilar, and then with a group that gets alternating cycles of the reference product and the biosimilar. And you so a three-arm trial, a large trial, more than likely, to demonstrate equivalence at the end. And so you've gotta have all of that to be able to show this, is, this product is interchangeable with the reference product. So what about substitution? Again, Georgia pharmacy law is relevant here um, because if, we want to, if a pharmacist wants to substitute one product for another, that can happen at the state, independently of the interchangeability level. So biosimilars are creating a new source of legislative angst for every state because they have laws for generics that some states may elect to say, we're just gonna apply the generic laws to the biosimilar category. 
Um, I don't think that's going to happen, to be honest. But more states are likely to craft new legislation or amendments to current legislation saying this is what a pharmacist can do um, to interchange different areas. And so right now, a pharmacist may substitute um, an interchangeable biologic product, which doesn't exist, uh, the lowest retail price to interchangeable product in stock, et cetera, et cetera. And if you look at some of the concerns that we people may have and clinicians may have with biosimilars, thinking, well, they're not the same as the reference product, don't forget that we've, we've kind of dealt with this in other areas for a long time. Human growth hormone was substituted. There are many different insulin types out there, and patients with diabetes may move from the Lilly product to the uh, Novartis product to other products pretty readily. Um, and we don't really think about that or have major concerns about that clinically. It's a biological protein. Um, insulin is still a biological protein. Interferon alpha, there are multiple products there, but the pegylated and, and otherwise, and so we use different interferon products uh, within hepatitis. Influenza vaccine is sort of a, you know, you get what you get based on any given time. Heparin, low molecular weight heparins are partially derived and changed pretty frequently based on insurance from Lovenox to Fragman to others. Uh, we do that fairly readily um, in the clinics based on various areas. And so there is some degree of a similar precedent to, uh, to interchanging and moving between uh, proteins. So safety and efficacy of biosimilars, can you actually then say that we can confirm purity and potency and safety and efficacy? Well, we can definitely confirm purity and potency, and that's, I think, pretty well described in this whole area. Uh, but the comparability is going to be much more, uh, much more important. And the bigger thing is that, much like the examples of the Epoetin um, manufacturing changes that I mentioned previously, a huge part of all this from the regulatory perspective is pharmacovigilance and post-marketing surveillance. People in the room who have submitted a MedWatch form yourself, raise your hand. Three. Three people. That tells you the current state of our pharmacovigilance in the US today. We don't do it a lot because I can tell you that post-marketing surveillance is very well done when you put in a REMS program. And if you're a clinician, a REMS program is the most painful thing on the planet to have to deal with. But that was FDA's response to certainly drugs like the IMIDs, but also other drugs like, um, like ipilimumab had a REMS for a while, which has been removed. Uh, et cetera. And so the REMS program um, was part of that pharmacovigilance process. We may see more REMS with these drugs. We may not. It'll be interesting to see how it plays forward, but you've got to have better post-marketing surveillance today in the U.S. than we have. Remember the two examples for Epoetin were in Europe, and they have a pretty robust pharmacovigilance model that tracks back. And the bigger issue is if you create a drug that's immunogenic, a biosimilar that's immunogenic, and you develop red cell aplasia, that's a flashing red light. If you develop a biosimilar monoclonal antibody to bevacizumab, and you develop a neutralizing antibody, your patient progressed. Patients progress all the time. So knowing whether or not that was done in the con or that happened in the context of a neutralizing antibody is one thing. Knowing whether or not it happened in the context of natural disease progression that we see is another. And so it's going to become a much more challenging area to define what might be immunogenicity related versus not. And immunogenicity is likely to be the number one issue in a post-marketing environment. But again, we certainly accept that there are these things that may happen in the clinic already. So pharmacovigilance is going to be, um, it'll be interesting to see how FDA and other regulatory authorities go after pharmacovigilance. Is it going to be upfront for risk minimization? You're gonna to have to be registered to use biosimilars. You're gonna to have to promise to um, put in data that shows your patient got this biosimilar in the real world for this period of time. The hard part will be there's no reference data. It's not like we do this with Avastin or Herceptin today. And so how would that data be compared? Um, and then finally, on the front end, something we'll talk about as well, and that's the naming of biosimilars overall. Biosimilar naming has created a lot of, uh, or did create a lot of consternation because if you remember back, there are these four-letter suffixes that go after, after the name. And this is a big issue for pharmacists and healthcare systems, but these naming standards are actually going to be pretty important for pharmacovigilance overall. And these naming standards were adopted fully in 2017, so they can't be changed. This is it. This is what we have for naming of biosimilars. And that's 
you have the product itself or the four lowercase meaningless suffix. So Philgrastum dash SNDZ was selected by the company and it was meant to say Sandoz's um, Phil Graston because they wanted the marketing to go with the generic name. It makes sense. And FDA has said no more, that can't happen for a number of reasons. One is companies' names change. And so SNDZ may not be SNDZ in, SNDZ in 10 years because there may not be a Sandoz. They may be eaten by somebody else. And so they've said, well, we're going to maintain a lowercase meaningless four letter suffix so that we can track these drugs in the market. And if you go to gabio.com, in, the, in the Europe right now, there are four bevacizumab, a table of biosimilar drugs that's about 30 deep. And if every single one of those comes forward, that's a huge number of drugs to come onto the market in a flood. It has implications for pharmacovigilance if all of them are used equally. It has implications for, honestly, stock space in a pharmacy. You can't stock all those drugs in a given space. And, we're, and most pharmacies are already um, packed to the gills with drugs as, as they exist now. So if all of those come forward, then there's going to be pretty big, pretty big issues. And that's just for biosimilarity. That's not for interchangeability. So there's going to be, when companies decide to try to be interchangeable, there's going to be a different naming convention. The label itself is going to look very different for a biosimilar drug than it looks for a reference product today. There's going to be this biosimilar uh, statement that's going to have to be in every label, and there's going to be a lot more clinical pharmacology data how those studies, how those experiments were designed, what the PK data looked like, confidence intervals, et cetera. And the purpose behind that is, again, to show you that FDA has said, look, we believe these drugs are biosimilar based on preclinical and clinical data. So how will these drugs play out economically? Well, it'll be interesting to see. If you go back to generics, to generic drugs, generics actually aren't that old, or at least in my mind. 1984, the Hacks Watchman Act um, amendment showed put forward the idea that you may be able to have a patent life for a given reference drug. Before that, there wasn't necessarily the case. And so they allowed the generic firm to use the safety and efficacy data of the innovator product. And so that then led to um, specific regulatory requirements within the drug label, within the drug itself, formulation, purity. And again, it's pretty straightforward for a chemist and pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical scientist to put drugs together that are small molecules. But economically, when you go across all drugs, in 84, when the, F, when the amendment was approved, 12% were generic. In 2012, 80% were generic. And so it really increased the number of generics that were on the market and that were used in routine practice for drugs that had gone out of their patent life. So what are the cost savings of biosimilars? And this is where the two groups go crazy in the different economic forecasting. So Express Scripts, a big payer, um, is clearly believing in a very rosy future for biosimilars. They suggest that there's a potential $250 billion savings over the next 10 years if 11 likely biosimilars across all indications enter the market. $250 billion. I think that's probably an overstatement. But the Congressional Budget Office, which has certainly been in the news a lot lately for a variety of reasons, estimates it to be about $25 billion over a 10-year period. So a tenfold difference uh, based on um, differing economic forecasting. Well, why might that difference be? Well, Medicare is suggesting that right now uh, their part B, the biosimilars would fall under their reimbursement slightly higher than average sales price. And the payment for biosimilars is average sales price plus 6% of the reference biologic. And so they will pay for these drugs. FDA is, or um, Med CMS is paying for them now. Um, and Part D, they're going to treat like new branded drugs. And so there'll be uh, no gap discount for biosimilars, which is part of Part D these days. And they will be con not be considered different drugs for satisfying Part D formulary requirements. And so that means that um, biosimilar bevacizumab would be treated the same as Avastin in terms of formulary requirements, which puts the onus then on institutions to figure it out. So commercial payer coverage will likely be based on cost differential, whether or not they're interchangeable. So if you have a biosimilar, if, if Avastin is $100 and biosimilar bevacizumab is $75, well, that's probably going to lead to more use. And so that gap of pricing will dictate in and of itself what it might be. Um, but and how closely the biosimilar matches that price will be an interesting to see. The other question is what price they'll pick, and I'll talk about that in a second. CMS, the patient community, and the medical community. So 
overall, does the provider community believe the data in these drugs? Do they believe that these are going to be okay? I remember when generic Paclitaxel came out, you know, it had a different vehicle versus brand name Taxol, and some individuals were very concerned about the vehicle being different and safety implications thereof. And today we use generic Paclitaxel all the time, so it really didn't bear out to be um, a major issue over the longer period of time. But when you look at some of the commercial reimbursement, if I'm Genentech and I've got the brand name Avastin with the brand name Herceptin, and I see a biosimilar um, Bevacizumab and a biosimilar Trastuzumab, but I've still got TDM1, which is a brand name marketed drug, and I put together a bundling of my drugs to your institution or you as a payer, and I say, okay, you can buy the biosimilar, but I'm gonna jack the price of TDM1 to this to make up for my lost revenue because you're using the biosimilar. So the bundling strategies that companies and payers will use will also alter this. This is not just a single price of a drug versus a single price of another drug. This is packages of drugs made by companies. And so um, there will be a period of time, and probably a long period of time, where the innovator product will still have patent exclusivity and will maintain the market share as much as and as long as they can. And then there will be the time where you know, that becomes more of a level playing field. Will this drive innovation? Will this stifle innovation? Hard to know. Hard to, for me to believe that innovation will not be, uh, will not continue in various areas, but biosimilars will start to gain a greater and greater proportion of market share over time. There's certainly been heavy investment by the FDA in creating a regulatory path for this. I know some of the folks at FDA who've worked in this space, worked on ODAC committees. Um, the clinical pharmacology guys have done, I think, a pretty good job in their thoughts around assays and reference products, et cetera. Um, the first biosimilar antibodies to be used for the active treatment of cancer are likely to be approved within the next six to 12 months. And whether or not they're used will depend on whether or not clinicians buy into the data and believe that the biosimilar is truly functionally equivalent for the patients that they serve, how much the pricing, bundling strategies, and reimbursement will play in for any given payer or institution. And then finally, what does the post-marketing surveillance data show? And is it something that where there's a safety signal, much like the EPO examples where people say, um, we're done and a very bad post-marketing signal could kill the whole field if, um, if it's something that's incredibly, uh, incredibly negative. Uh, so with that, I'll stop uh, a few minutes early and be happy to take questions. Thank you.